Right. Thank you for joining us today. This presentation is one of several presentations that are being offered this week as part of Open Education Week. We invite you to attend the other presentations offered. You can see the link to our library news blog in the chat. So let me put that in there now. All right, there's the link to, to the chat, I mean, to the library news post. And let me see, I've got the, um, let me introduce our presenter today. Uh, Dr. Sarah Roby is Assistant Professor and Director of Under Undergraduate Studies in the History Department. She teaches a variety of courses ranging from introductory level US history to upper division electives such as the history of energy and nuclear history. Her research focuses on the history of nuclear science and technology in the context of everyday life. Her first book, Atomic Americans, Citizens in a Nuclear State, explores how everyday Americans reacted in the advent of nuclear weapons. She is currently working on a book-length social and environmental history of Idaho National Laboratory. Dr. Roby holds a PhD in history from Temple University and has held past fellowships at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, the Miller Center for Public Affairs at the University of Virginia, and the Philadelphia History Museum. With that introduction, we'll uh, turn the time over to uh, Dr. Roby. Thanks so much, Spencer, and um, thanks to everyone involved in OER Week for organizing these sessions and also uh, your continued commitment to uh, helping faculty work through some of these, uh, you know, some of these programs and some of these objectives um, campus wide. I think uh, they are really valuable. Um, I know students really appreciate it too. So um, thanks for inviting me to be here. Um, so I thought I'd uh, talk today a little bit about some past OER work that I've done, and I'm using OER kind of synonymously with low and no cost just to avoid the mouthful uh, of, of various initiatives that we could think about here. But I've done some previous OER work um, that I think will sort of set the stage a little bit for what I've done this year with this uh, the more, more recent stipend um, and sort of talk you through what I set out to do, what I uh, accomplished during the stipend period and what I'm doing now in the classroom as a result. Um, so this is my second round uh, thinking about OER and low cost materials uh, at ISU. So back in 2019, the first year that we had OER um, investigation stipends available, uh, what I did for that program was uh, think about how I could uh, use purely open access, not just low cost or free, but you know, purely open access resources for uh, a course that I teach pretty regularly, U.S. History 2. Um, and for those of you who haven't taken a history course in a while, that's uh, U.S. History since the Civil War, more or less. Um, and uh, you know, I won't go into all, what all I did to review the available options, but I settled on um, a, a U.S. history textbook that is free, completely free and open access when you use it online or you use an ebook version. Um, and what I liked about that particular text is there was a print option. Now, it wasn't free; it was thirty dollars, um, but it was yet another kind of option for students, um, some of whom really prefer having a, a textbook in front of them, you know, paper book that they can write on or something like that. It also meant that there were plenty of used and rental uh, books on the market. Um, so students had a lot of options for that, but if they, if they were on a strict budget or didn't mind the format, they could use it for free. And I think in that, in that session, and that semester, I think about 75% of my students used an online only free version of that. Um, during that, during that uh, first kind of campus wide adventure into OER, there was a lot of discussion within my department among my history colleagues about uh, how to implement this and, and the various successes and difficulties we all found across different disciplines. And what we sort of realized is that for courses like US history, there are actually a lot of really great options for low cost, no cost OER. Um, but for more specialized courses, even though 
the even some of those that we teach at the lower division, um, it gets a little bit harder to find one book or one set of materials that covers everything we need. So the courses that we as a department had a harder time addressing for OER and low and no cost is, um, you know, things like women's history, uh, women's world history, women's history in the United States, things like uh, world history actually have a really hard time with good open access um, textbooks as well. So I kind of lucked out in that I'm an Americanist, right? I teach US history and I had lots of options to me, open to me. But another need that we identified, and, and this is what I carried with me to this second round of OER investigation, um, is the issue of methodology courses in history and what we can do with our course materials in that vein, right? So methodology courses aren't are not ones that deal with a specific subject matter, but rather get into the nitty gritty of what we do in history and how we do it and who does it and these sorts of questions. So for this year, the 2022-23 OER invest, I guess it was mostly 2022, now that I think about it, last year's OER experimentation was addressing a course that I have taught almost every semester for the past three or four years. And that's uh, what we call introduction to research. Um, history 2291. Uh, for those of you who have been at ISU for a while, we used to call this course the historian's craft, but we rebranded it to be introduction to research to better convey that this is a course that's open for generalist students. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, so introduction to research, this class, uh, it wears a lot of hats in terms of the learning objectives and what we hope to do with this course. So first and foremost, the course is a general education eight information literacy. Uh, it has that designation. So we have students in the class who have nothing to do with history but need a gen ed eight. Those students end up in this course as well. Um, internally, this is a course that's required for all history majors, and right now we have about 120 history majors. It's also highly recommended for history minors and students who are education majors uh, with endorsements in history or social studies. Um, so it's a, really, a course that we really, really highly encourage that set of students uh, to take as well. Um, we offer this course uh, synchronously online and in person, um, mostly because it's it's fairly interactive. We do not off well, we're testing this in the fall, but historically we have not offered it asynchronously. So it's very like live based class. Um, usually the enrollments are between 20 and 30 students, especially now that we've started teaching it every semester. And while we don't have really hard numbers on this, I would say about 80% of students who take the class are taking it either as education, history education students or history students. There's still 20% who are taking it as a gen ed course though. Um, okay, so, so wearing all of these hats, you know, it being for history majors, it being for education, you know, future teachers, as well as gen ed, um, you know, we have way more learning objectives in this course than your average history course. So we're covering both digital and analog information literacy as the gen ed marker uh, conveys. Um, we're introducing the broad contours of what the history field does in general, as I mentioned before. We're also teaching students the fundamentals of research, again, online and analog research, um, and also teaching students the fundamentals of historical writing. Um, which, you know, differ substantially enough that we have to, to teach this um, alongside other gen ed courses that, that deal with written communication. Um, so having now taught this course nearly every semester for, for a number of years now, I will be the first to admit that we have a lot going on with this course and perhaps as a department we might think about the challenges that that presents. But this also creates unique challenges for course materials. So the reason I've spent all this time explaining all of this is it's really the unique features of teaching this course have dictated how I've thought about uh, reducing material costs for the students. Okay, so what I used to do with the class is I had um, one, I have, I have my visual aids here, it doesn't really matter, you don't need to catch these names, but I had uh, one textbook that I would assign that is really a methodology textbook. It's dense, it's um, theory heavy, it's definitely not designed to teach you how to write historically, but it's very, very good at teaching students, um, you know, 
what the field as a whole does, what our subfields are, what our methodological questions are. Alongside that, I would also assign what I'm calling a, a history research and writing handbook. So this one is called A Short Guide to Writing About History, but there's a whole cottage industry of books like this out there. I think at this point, I probably own a dozen or more of them. So this is what I used to do, two books, each doing a very different thing. Um, between the two books, uh, costs for students would range from at least $45 up until 60 or 70 depending on the edition, depending on used new rental and all of that. Um, so, you know, the, the cost was not unsubstantial, right? And, and history textbooks tend to cost a little bit more than what I've come to understand. Uh, some science fields do and that sort of thing. But as far as history courses go, this was still one of the pricier ones um, as far as course materials went. So what I set out to do with uh, the OER stipend this year is um, I purchased, reviewed, and, and read uh, a whole bunch of different options, right? Because like I said, there, there are lots of books out there that teach you what it is to do history. Um, so I, I purchased a whole bunch of them, spent a, a good amount of time last year reading through them. Um, and I saw this as an opportunity not only to reduce costs, but also to refresh my curriculum because whatever book I chose in place of the previous ones would also require some curriculum redesign as well. Um, so what I settled on um, was what I was looking for, what I was hoping I would find, and what I did is kind of, it's a book called um, The Information Literate Historian. And for the most part, this book is a lot like those handbooks, those guides to reading and writing in history, but it has quite a lot more about information literacy and it's very much up to date with digital information literacy. So in addition to, you know, having sections about, um, say, uh, how to tackle Chicago style citations or how to think about forming an argument, how to look for resources for sources, it also has some more general uh, information about information literacy, which I thought was very important. Um, this book runs about $30 new. It can be purchased used for about 15, um, which I thought was quite uh, attractive, especially you know, compared to a course that was costing upwards of 50, 60, $70 before. Um, and so while this cost savings uh, is at least 50% for the students, I also wanted to think outside the box in terms of uh, what we could do in a depart as a department to uh, make, uh, you know, for our majors, minors, and, and education students, what could we do to reduce the long-term costs? And so what I did is I got, uh, I, I met up with um, Dr. Marie Stango, also giving a presentation later this week, uh, to talk about uh, the two methodology courses that we have in the history department. Mine, Intro to Research is one, and then there's a senior level seminar. Um, and we decided it would actually be really useful if we both, ooh, if we both assigned the same book for those two classes. Um, primarily because this is, it's a handbook, right? It's something designed to come back to again and again, it's instructional in nature, and it can absolutely be used not only for these two required methodology courses, but in plenty of other history classes that have you write a research paper or the like. Um, so not only does this save costs for students who take the class 2291 just uh, you know, alone, as a standalone, but also for students who remain in the program and take other history courses. Um, this can be a reusable piece of course material. Um, so re reducing the cost in two courses instead of just one, potentially. Again, every student's kind of course trajectory is a little bit differently. Um, so the changes I've just outlined, assigning this new information literate historian uh, guidebook, handbook, um, you know, the way I was able to reduce costs on that front was pretty easy, right? Because there is such a bevy of different types of handbooks available for history courses like this. So what then though, about the parts of the curriculum for this class that focus on different things, such as subfields, methodologies, big issues in the field, how the field has transformed over the last 150 years. Um, that took a bit more creativity. 
And here's what I ended up doing. Um, because I was not able to find a replacement for that bigger methodology book that I used to assign, um, what I decided to do is build into my curriculum a couple, uh, just a couple of chapters from this book, uh, amounts to about eight or nine percent of the book as a whole. Those are scanned and available to my students uh, on Moodle. I've also I'm also relying quite a lot more on ISU's uh, journal databases, you know, the ones available through the library, which doubles as uh, important skill building exercises for students. Um, so, so, you know, I, I have scanned readings, I have database readings, but more than anything, it has required me to put a lot more weight on that sort of curriculum in my lectures. So it used to be the case students would read through these method, you know, methodologically focused chapters, um, and then we sort of reinforce them in class. The sum of these changes has meant I'm introducing a lot more of that content, and it's heavyweight content um, in the lectures and in, in class uh, in class sessions. Um, so the results of this work, right? It, uh, students are still getting the same kind of range of content, if not exactly word for word as they used to. Um, these results are good from a student cost perspective, um, but as sort of a trade off, they have put a little, it has put a little bit more pressure in terms of what I am hoping to accomplish as an instructor in my day to day um, interactions with these students, right? Uh, it, it puts a little bit more pressure on that long list of what I need to do in this course um, for students to, to uh, you know, to succeed, get the skills they need and move on. So despite these drawbacks, okay, so, so anyway, some total, I only assign one book. <laughs> it's about half the cost of uh of what the course materials used to be um but what i'm doing is augmenting that with a lot of uh instructor developed materials instead so despite that drawback though about trade-offs uh, about it adding to my lecture curriculum and and packing more into an already tight uh semester i still think that what we've done in the history department with this course and then the um uh, the second methodology course in history, I still think this is the correct way to move forward. I think it standardizes our curriculum a little bit, which is helpful across, um, you know, having multiple instructors teach these courses. Um, but as a whole for the history curriculum, I think it's it's a move in the right direction, especially given um, all of the uh, considerations and financial and other constraints that our students have, absolutely. Um, it is, however, worth mentioning that the move towards, at least in, in my experience with this one course, the move toward low or no cost text, textbooks can also put additional pressure on curriculum design. And the stipend last year right, made that extra work a bit easier to, to justify and to, to carve out time for and to have compensated work. Um, but I think it's important to understand these programs not only like certainly prioritize, but not only about reducing student costs, but also figuring out a way to support instructors in the labor that it takes to move towards those low costs. Right? Still, 100% believe in this, uh, you know, in in the need for lower cost curriculum. Um, but you know, we also have to be mindful of of what that means on the instructor side of things too. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I have prepared. Hopefully, that wasn't too much to take in, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you all have. Um, and thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Roby. That was really interesting. Um, yeah, so um, if you have questions, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question, or you can post that in the chat and I can read those. Yeah, that, that was really fascinating. Um, and I appreciate all the deep context that really helped me understand what all you were doing. Um, having taught uh, a mostly for majors literature course, um, but was also sort of open to others. Um, what I was curious about in particular, you mentioned sort of the database um, assignment. And I was just curious if you could talk a little bit more about how you set that up. Like, do you have students look for a 
do you ask students to look for a particular named article or do you just sort of say, look for an article that's within the last five years from this one journal? I can see really good uses for either one, but I just, I'm curious how you actually employ that in your course. And thanks again for all the work you do. It sounds fascinating. Yeah, thank you. No, it's a great question. Um, so we've actually been really intentional about scaffolding this into the overall curriculum of this course. Um, about two thirds of the way into the semester, students are actually writing a primary source based, very short, you know, four or five pages research paper that requires them to get on the databases and explore on their own. But long before they get to that point, I give them some assigned readings. Um, so yes, naming the article and giving them the full citation to something like a journal like the Public Historian or The Historian, which tend to have really good articles about uh, how we do history. Um, I give them the full citation. I give them a little primer in class about how to navigate, you know, either the databases or search by journal um, so that by the time they get later in the semester and have to go off and find their own primary and secondary sources, they've already had some experience with a very directed um, you know, go recall this this article um, as the assigned reading. So yeah, to, to answer your question a little bit more short, uh, condensedly, more condensed, in a more condensed way, um, you know, I, I give them a, a short tutorial in class, they have to find an assigned reading on the databases, and then later they are sort of let go more to their own devices in terms of collecting their own sources. Uh, thanks. That makes a lot of sense. I was wondering how it would work as a sort of we would all be discussing something if it was a little bit more choose your own adventure within these parameters. But yeah, giving uh, yeah. a known item makes a lot of sense. But yeah, thanks. for this for this class, we tend to mostly read the same stuff until they get to that research paper stage. Um, it just helps us keep a little bit more focus to our fifty minute sessions. I'm I'm actually uh, excited to hear that's your approach and and that's the way you do it because uh, when students and faculty researchers on campus use the library databases I mean I'm speaking from the perspective of, of a librarian but uh, when when individuals go into the databases to find the sources that helps uh, increase our statistics which helps us to uh, justify the purchase of these databases and the purchase of these uh, subscriptions to these journals and so forth. So I'm really glad that's what you do. Um, I was curious um, um, if you were to give some advice to a, a faculty member that was exploring the idea of implementing or adapting OER into their course, what kind of advice would you give to them? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, what my experience, and then, you know, especially talking with others in my department, um, there's a real uh, discipline specific kind of path to take for these questions. But I think broadly, um, the biggest, um, the most difficult part of this process is the kind of Google searching, searching reviews, searching, you know, uh, professional literature, trying to find those sources and then just spending time reading them, right? So typically a, a, a US survey course textbook is three or 400 pages. And so it, it takes some time to, you know, kind of dig through and make sure it's getting at the big things that you want it to. So, um, you know, in terms of advice about finding those sources in the first place, I think that that's something that's much more specific to each discipline and each field. But the process of reviewing and making good decisions, if you have choices, right, if you have more than one thing uh, that you're considering, um, it's really just a matter of sitting down with your curriculum, sitting down with the, the possible books and making sure that those things align or you're prepared to adjust your curriculum to match the new book. Um, and like I said, it's time consuming, but um, it's, it's part of the necessary labor of, of, you know, making these sorts of changes. Great. Um, I have one other question, but if others have questions uh, that they would like to ask, uh, uh, we can let them unmute themselves as well if they're interested. Have you? Um... Sorry, I, I play a double role, uh, Dr. Roby, uh, as a librarian and, and faculty. So I'm very interested in 
in OER and supporting OER. Uh, have you brought in interactive components? That's something that I'm working on uh, in, in your course as part of this exercise. And have you had success with that? Um, are you talking about sort of uh, interactive activities that are kind of built by others that I'm implementing or interactive activities that I'm creating and using? I guess that would be both. And would it, is it inset within the OER or are you using it? Um, and I guess my question does include something as simple as H5P in Moodle to support the OER. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, I think there are a bunch of different ways to, to answer this question. Um, I think in my own, just with my teaching style, I like to do a lot of in-class activities, even if it's on Zoom, like there are ways of, of doing this that um, encourage students to actually engage with something like a database or engage with some sources or a tool, like a research tool or a, a web search tool um, that, you know, you can't really replicate by just showing students how to do it, right? The, right. You, have, you have to you have to get them to go work through the steps as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's really central just to my teaching philosophy and, and my pedagogy to begin with. And so I'm always looking for opportunities uh, to do that. As far as kind of like exterior tools uh, building in either to Moodle or to the OER resources, um, that's a little bit more limited in terms of the resources that I'm using. So it might be a very good online textbook, um, but you know the, the bells and whistles that come with a, a fee-based um, even ebook or, or a physical textbook, um, that definitely strips away when you start having free, <laughs> free online content. There are many, many fewer um, right. of the sorts of interactive uh, tools that another publisher might, you know, who's charging might use. Um, and as far as, you know, I'm a pretty basic Moodle user. I don't, uh, <laughs> I haven't really like. Well, no, I, I, and this is exactly why I'm asking because I, I tend to be more workshop hands-on, we're doing this all together. And so I do struggle in types of uh, my own curriculum um, in bringing uh, online components in such an interactive way sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering if, if you've been able to, to capture that. <laughs> yeah, well, I think one thing that is to my advantage, so I, I mentioned we teach this course every semester in the history department, um, but because we offer our whole BA uh, online, uh, we are uh, committed to offering this course at least online, it, it, online synchronously at least once a year, and that's usually my sections. I'm the one who teaches it on Zoom. And actually teaching on Zoom, for the most part, if I can make sure that the students are, are on computers and not on their phones for class, teaching on Zoom actually enables a lot more of that. Okay, take five minutes, go into your browser and do this activity, come back. And, and that might be harder to do in a classroom because I can't expect every student to bring a computer with them. When you're teaching synchronously online, they've already got that those um the equipment at least in front of them and so that's one advantage now i don't know that that's replicable <laughs> across all of all of our courses um but that is one thing that i found to be in my benefit teaching online thank you yeah, thank you well i i did have another question um i'm i'm curious to know uh what feedback have you received from students do they appreciate this OER? Do they recognize what it is? I mean, what what do you hear from students? Yeah, um, I, so I taught with the new course materials for introduction to research in the fall. So that was my sort of first test run. With those students, I mean, they hadn't taken the class before. Uh, and so it sort of just looked like normal course materials to them. They knew that I was shifting from a previous syllabus because I was you know, admitting to them sometimes, oh, this is a new thing. I haven't lectured about this before. Let's try it. Um, but I don't know that they were very cognizant of the court of the fee reduction or um, material cost reduction uh, for that class. For my earlier OER class that I mentioned at the beginning of, of our session today, um, that this was the one where there was an online version that was completely free and open access. And then if they wanted a print version, they could get one. 
Um, I did, I was able to have some anecdotal kind of conversations with students about that. A lot of them really liked having the online version. Um, and, you know, I didn't usually push for whether that was an accessibility thing or that was a cost thing or that was just a convenience thing. Um, I didn't really feel comfortable kind of pushing and gathering data on that front. Um, but in that class, I think uh, having the options, having the choice was very evident, uh, evident as, as uh, a benefit for the students that they um, told me about. So um, yeah, I imagine students like not paying as much for textbooks, but whether or not they realize what it could have been is, you know, not, uh -huh. it's not something that they, I think, think about. Great. Um, yeah, it's 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 really uh, interesting to hear uh, your experiences with OER. Thank you for presenting today. Um, are there any final questions or comments that anyone would like to ask or or say uh, before we conclude our our session today? Do you have a final word you'd like to share, uh, Dr. Roby? Um, no, I hadn't hadn't thought about a final word. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I think this is a, it's a challenge to kind of make, you know, go through the process of, of identifying and assigning and implementing and getting used to new curriculum. Um, but I think it is, uh, on the whole, a benefit both in terms of student, um, you know, advantages for students as well as, you know, it just keeps me working on revising my curriculum, which is never a bad thing either. So it's sort of an extra silver lining on the thing. Well, thank you for all that you do for students and uh, thank you for, for, for what you do for our university. And um, we want to encourage everybody to attend the other OER uh, pre presentations this week. Uh, we do have uh, a link to, to those presentations in the chat through our library news post. Um, if you need that again, we can uh, post that one more time, but uh, if there are no other comments or, or questions, I think uh, we'll, we'll end this presentation today. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Roby. Thank you, thank you for presenting and, and for all that you do for our students. I think uh, whether they recognize it or not, this OER is, is quite a benefit uh, for our students. And I th we've heard uh, and discovered research that suggests that it can increased retention, not only um, for graduation, but also within uh, courses themselves. And uh, I think uh, it helps those students that are maybe more um, first generation uh, students and they have access and they, they succeed and do better in those courses with OER as well. So um, thank you again. And um, if there are no other comments, we'll, we'll finish for the day and we'll I uh, wish you all to have a Thank good you. day. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah.